Barry Cranford. I'm the founder of the LJC um, and the organizer of uh, a bunch of different groups around here, um, including the Aspiring Speakers Group and the Aspiring Women Speakers Group. Um, and the whole point of the event today and, and what we're trying to do here is really launch a new generation of, of speakers um, within the LJC and within the, the London tech scene. Can you hear me? Yes, Mark, we can hear you. Yeah, Loud and clear. I can't hear you. I don't know why. Okay. I'll keep talking, Mark. I'll keep talking and you, you just let me know. Um, but yeah, so, so this whole thing is about trying to, um, trying to get new speakers up and running within the LJC and beyond. Um, and based on what we've seen, uh, we've seen so many Java champions uh, and, and other conference speakers come start their, their um, careers here, their speaking careers here, and then go on to do conference circuits and speak at all the major conferences around and, and do keynotes and things like that. So we're really trying to, to make that happen um, as, as much as we can. Um, so yeah, so that's what the whole thing is about. Um, so if anybody that's not speaking today wants to speak, um, going to be sharing a few links of how to do that in the chat and we'll put them on the YouTube channel as well afterwards and um, so we'd love to constantly get new speakers um, so so yeah so that's all from me um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker of today um, let me just double check Helen I believe that is you it is me thank you Real. whenever you're ready then all right uh, so thanks Barry good news I've got no slides um, <laughs> So we've got a really small group today and I had the privilege of attending one of Barry's workshops actually that he spoke about uh, last week, I think it was. And one of, the, one of the things that came out of that workshop was to give some kind of framework for new speakers of how they could potentially put together a talk. Now, me being me, I thought, well, okay, fine, I'll, I'll try it, I'll see if it works. So this is me trying, trying the thing. Uh, this talk's been prepped with about 20, 25 minutes, and it needs audience interaction. So um, I see most of you have your videos on already, which is amazing. Uh, Craig, Hamza, if you are able to pop your video on, please do. Love to see your beautiful faces. If not, get your little virtual hand ready because we're going to play a game. Uh, if your virtual hand isn't feeling very active, you can put your answer in the chat as well. So, like I said, we're going to play a game and the game is called Have You Ever? But there's no alcohol and no inappropriateness. So, first question. Three pieces, well, before that, I'm going to take you through three pieces of knowledge that have changed my career. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the framing for this. So, first question. Have you ever found yourself hammering out a really angry email that you should probably sleep on before sending. All right, hands up. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot of you. Okay, me too. In fact, I'm amazing at them. Um, <laughs> so I was given a piece of advice about 10 years ago uh, as a technical writer because, you know, I, I write a lot of emails. And the piece of advice was to take out, hey, Hamza, uh, was to take out the sentence in the email that I was most proud of and I thought well that's really counterintuitive why would I take out the sentence that I'm most proud of what are you on and she said she said Helen try it and I was a bit like whatever so I went away and next time I found myself writing one of these really sassy emails I scanned it and I found the sentence that I was most proud of and then I realized what she was saying because it will be the, the most sassiest, the worst, the most snippy sentence in the whole email. So if you take out the sentence that you are most proud of, the email will read a lot better. So that's my first piece of advice. Take out the bit you're proud of, if it's a sassy email anyway. All right, next question. Have you ever found yourself wondering why you can't get the recognition that you feel you deserve? Yep, again, quite a few hands going up. Uh, this is a really recent revelation for me. Uh, I recently attended a six weeks confidence course run by Lauren Curry. And it's actually something that she said that really landed with me and it landed incredibly hard actually because I've struggled with this throughout my whole career. Um, and she said this, she said, achievements do not speak for themselves. And I sat there going, what do you mean they don't speak for themselves? I've been told for 40 plus years that achievements speak for themselves. 
I've been raised with this phrase that achievements speak for themselves. And they don't. And they especially don't if you're from a minority group. It's amplified. Now, this is when you're going into a meeting with your, your manager and you've, you're sat there thinking, I've done all these cool things. Why do you not know this? They don't know it because you haven't told them because your achievements don't speak for themselves. You have to speak for yourself. You have to advocate for yourself. If you don't tell other people what you're doing, then other people don't know what you're doing. It's, it really is that simple. So that's the second piece of knowledge that I've learned in my career is that achievements do not speak for themselves. You have to do that. Okay, last question. Remember, hands up if, um, if you agree. So have you ever said, I can't do that? Yeah, probably pretty much all of you. Um, again, this is a fairly recent revelation that I, uh, I came across, and it's from a, a lady called Dr. Carol Dweck, and she talks about a growth mindset. And this is very, very easy to explain. It is the difference between saying, my code doesn't work, my code doesn't work yet. I can't do that Java certification. I can't do that Java certification yet. And it's just this tiny little word, yet. And when you tag it onto sentences, it makes a world of difference to your mindset. And I, I, I was skeptical initially. I was like, well, yet can't do that much, surely. But the more research I did, and I, I read some of the papers that um, Dr. Carol Dweck has done, and some of the research that they've done on how malleable our brains are, especially as a child, of course. We, we all know that they're very malleable as a child. And they can be devastated in one sentence, devastated when you're a child. And as an adult, it's really easy to hold on to, the, hold on to that, those kind of experiences and say, well, my teacher said I sucked at maths, therefore I suck at maths. But if you actually just say, oh, I'm not great at maths yet, it makes a world of difference to how you approach, how you problem solve, how you challenge yourself, how you, how you embrace challenges. Um, the effort that you put in, the criticism that you receive, and how you can find lessons and inspiration in the success of others as well. So those are the three things. Take out the sassy sentence, take out the sentence you are most proud of. Achievements do not speak for themselves, especially if you're from a minority group, you have to do that. And have a growth mindset and see where it takes you. That's it, thanks for listening. Amazing. Thanks, Helen. That was great. And you put that together in 25 minutes? Yeah. Get in. Love that. Okay, cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, does it, in fact, does anyone have any questions before I ask a question of my own? Feel free to raise your hand. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. On my mute button. Uh, Helen, I was wondering, do, do, does something you say, I forgot, I think it was the second question. Um, is, is it almost impossible to have a meritocracy then? If be, if everybody has to also be good at explaining their own skills and their own abilities and, and what they've done. So a meritocracy has to include those skills as well. It's a good question. Um, I don't know, is the honest answer. I think, I think for me, one thing I'm particularly passionate about, and I know I've been guilty of, is I've gone into a number of meetings with superiors and I've been annoyed that they do not know what I have done or what I have contributed. Mm -hmm. Now, I also know that sometimes when I'm verbally explaining stuff, I'm not as strong in my verbal explanations as I am in my written explanations, in part because I'm a, a technical writer and I was for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So I think you can still get across what you've been working on, make a list at the end of each week, make a list at the end of each month, get that information across because so many of us work our butts off and are equally willing to give that, um, give that credit away and certainly not claim it for ourselves. And that's something that I've, I'm recently learning how to do, to be completely honest with you. If I can add something else to that, um, 
I've seen a few times uh, agile teams doing show and tells after their sprints to say, yeah. "Hey, look, guys, we've we've achieved this." Um, uh, you know, showing to the product owner or, or whoever else, and uh, that that's probably part of the same sort of thing. Um, it's a good idea to actually tell people your achievements. Cool. Huge... Thank, thank you for the talk. Thank you. I actually had a question, Helen. Um, I, I don't know if, if this came up in the course um, or is something you've got any personal thoughts on, um, but I, I, I agree. I've, I've heard this, this um, achievements do not speak for themselves thing. And, and yeah, I think it's, it's such an important point to raise. Um, do you have a, a framework for how to get that across? How to, you know, especially for, um, for people that, that uh, you know, I know it's obviously very English um, to kind of be like, oh no, I'll, yeah. you know, I'm not going to go and boast about myself. Um, yeah. We had a LinkedIn expert talk about don't do a humble brag. Um, yeah. It's all about this humble brag. Like British people, we're not very good at, 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 at boasting about ourselves. Um, but do you have a, a framework that takes out the thinking, that takes out the yep. how do I word it or anything like that to use? I, at the end of each month, I go through our U-Track board and I extract absolutely everything that I've done and I put it in a document for my superiors so that I can evidence what I've done that month and why I've done it. I also um, write a personal blog um, of, I, I think it's called Life in Devrel or something like that, which I don't openly, uh, I mean, it's open to the public, but I don't tweet about it or anything because it's, it's as much for me as it is for anyone else, because I want to be able to evidence my journey, especially you know, with a with a career pivot from technical writing into developer advocacy, I want to be able to evidence my learnings. You know where I where I've grown, where I realise I've got gaps, what excites me, what scares me, and just constantly evidencing who I am and what I bring because I am amazing at getting to the end of a week and going, yeah, I didn't achieve anything. That's like, if, if that was a superpower, I have it nailed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I have to force myself to, um, to document my progress quite stringently because otherwise the little voices will take over. Yeah. Bastards. I know what you mean. Um, they uh, are. And I like, I like the, the term evidencing. I think that's a great way of putting it as well. Um, yep. Okay, cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so who is next? Uh, next we have Stathis. Yeah, thank welcome you. Back. Welcome back. Welcome <laughs> back. Hi, yeah, thanks for it. Whenever you're ready, then, man. Uh, just sharing now. All right. Um, yeah, so good morning. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my talk is, uh, let me put my microphone a little bit away from my face. Yeah, so my, my, my talk is a little bit technical. Uh, it has a lot of concepts in it, but I I'll try to uh, to be fast, and maybe in the future I'll do more detailed uh, engagements, speaking engagements with all those technologies. So today I'm going to talk about something very interesting that I did at my at the company I work at, uh, Thousand Eyes. So basically, uh, I we use uh, change data capture, which is a methodology I'm going to explain in a bit, to uh, publish events uh, from Mongo into a separate data store. Uh, DynamoDB, which is an AWS uh, NoSQL database using uh, Kafka and Kafka Connect. So uh, probably most of you are already familiar with uh, with Kafka, uh, but for those of you that don't know, basically um, it's a data store where you push events to it, and from the other side you can have consumers that consume events from it. And Kafka Connect is a framework from the Kafka ecosystem where Actually, it's also an ecosystem of uh, connectors, Kafka Connect, and you can deploy those pre-built Java programs or connectors, as they're called, where you can push data from Kafka into a data store or get data from a data store and push them into Kafka. And uh, this can be really useful. And one of those connectors is the Debezium connector, probably you've already, you've already heard. So the Debezium connector is a bunch of source connectors, as we call them, that they can, they can extract events from data stores like My, MySQL or Postgres or MongoDB, and they can push them into Kafka. And then a lot of interesting use cases can uh, happen. So the concept of uh, change data capture is the process right, of extracting those events from the database and doing something with them. And this has to be done near real time. And here is an example of an, an event, how it would look like as you would extract it from a database. So 
the reason we did this is because we had identified a bottleneck uh, in our architecture where we were querying a MongoDB cluster, a small cluster from multiple microservices. And uh, it wasn't scalable for us uh, because it was costing us a lot of money. We couldn't scale it up. It was very small data set, like around uh, a few gigabytes. And in general, it didn't make sense to scale it up uh, economically. So we, we decided to come up with this new architecture where we extract the state uh, with CDC, change data capture from Mongo. We push them into Kafka, which, uh, and, and from there we have other connectors that read from Kafka and push them to the target data store, which is DynamoDB in this case. And then we, you know, instead of going to this Mongo small cluster, we go to DynamoDB, uh, to DynamoDB, sorry. And uh, the, the, what we achieved with that is, first of all, we reduced all those reads from MongoDB because we had a lot of problems with it operationally. And also DynamoDB, it's, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a, it's a service from AWS, it's an OSQL database, but you don't care about managing it at all. You just specify how many reads and how many writes you want. And actually we're able to reduce also, it helps us a lot with, uh, with uh, our cost uh, predictions and stuff like that. So uh, to, to summarize, uh, it seems like Change Data Capture is a very uh, interesting tool to use. This is just one of the flavors, how you could potentially use it. Uh, the Bizium for doing Change Data Capture is great. It's a very robust tool I found. It's very easy to set up. And we also loved DynamoDB because the infrastructure management aspect of it is amazing. It's a space for what you use and uh, it, can, it can help you a lot. Uh, in your scaling journey. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Small and fast. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stathis. Does anyone have any uh, any questions about um, about Stathis's talk? Alex, did I see you on mute? No, I didn't see you on mute. Yeah, sorry. Did did anyone have any have any questions at all? Not a question. A more more a compliment, really. Uh, I do like hand drawn annotations in uh, okay. um, presentations they just make it so much more human my, my brain just goes "Ooh, nice <laughs> uh, so yeah I really liked that use my iPad with uh, stylus and uh, nice concepts yes Good <laughs> thank you thank you yeah I, I couldn't agree more with that it, it was the point because obviously uh, being non-technical myself it's it's difficult to to fully understand but it's the point where I can just about then keep up with with what's going on um, I'm, I've, I've thought about this before personally, and I'm always a bit too nervous to to include the hand drawn stuff. Um, so it's good to see more. So I think I might I might start to do it a little bit more. <laughs> what did you used to do it with, Stafford? Uh, it's an app called Concepts. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, and yeah. it's uh, it's paid up, but it's uh, I really like. It. It's very easy to start using it yeah. on the cool. iPad. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, okay, well, if there's no other questions, then I think we are good, um, in which case we'll go on over to our final talk, which is, um, which is Mark, Mark Stringer. Is your audio working now, Mark? Oh, I don't know if that's just me. Can anyone else hear Mark? Can't hear you, mate. Sorry, mate. Blame blame Zoom on this. He's going to uh, go and, and join us again, hopefully. Um, yeah. So just just while while we're waiting for Mark, um, one thing I will quickly say. Um, I'll find the link and put that on the chat in a bit. But we, as Helen alluded to earlier, we've started a uh, a speaker workshop, um, which is like a three step program. It's designed for people that have never spoken before, um, but could be for somebody that hasn't spoken for a while, or just somebody that's maybe low of confidence, feeling nervous, or not too sure on how to find a topic or decide on a topic to use or anything like that. Um, so you are all welcome to sign up um, if you're interested. Again, I'm gonna say most of the people here probably won't need it. Um, Helen came on and, and helped us out, but I can see Mark's back there. Mark, feel free to interrupt me if- um, I can hear you, yeah, I think you're a bit quiet. Can everyone else hear Mark? Very quiet. 
Hang on a second. That's good. Coming back. Keep coming back. Is that better? That's Perfect. That, That's better. Okay. Right. So we do all this prep before to make sure it all works, and it all yeah. works, and then we start going, and Zoom kills us. Uh, I'm still not able to screen share. I don't know what's going on there. Um, you're, you're not a co-host since you came back right. in, I think. Yeah, let me make you co-host again. So I mean, okay, right. Okay, so here's right. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about it's not a value stream, it's a swamp. Um, basically, this is the the phrase value stream uh, comes from people looking at the way Toyota built cars in the 80s when they were completely kicking the American car manufacturing uh, industry's ass. Um, the Americans gradually noticed that the Japanese were doing a lot better than they were at making cars. And people from places like Yale and Harvard started to go to Japan and look at what the Japanese were doing and try and formulate it in a way that might um, allow them to sell consultancy, obviously, but also um, hold out the hope of building things in a better way. Um, and so they looked a lot at kind of the way that Japanese did things on a production line. Um, and these are some of the things that some of the slogans that came out of it, limit work in progress. So only be building a small number of things at once um, focus on flowing through a production line so that there aren't too many stops and reducing waste. Um, and this is where the idea of a value stream comes in that um, if you've got a process, there are certain points of that process where you're adding in value. And then there are certain points in the process where you're waiting for things to happen. And if you're a car company, if you can reduce those times when things are waiting for something to happen and at every stage through the process you're adding value, then you get much better at making cars because all you're doing in your factories is making, is adding value to something that's a car. Um, people, in software development, which was always, and some people might say still always, struggling for metaphors for what software development is and how it works, um, picked up on this and started to take this kind of Harvard consultancy, um, looking at car manufacturer and pick it up and try and use it um, as a model for software development. So sometimes this is quite subtle and obscured as it is in the Scrum books, but it's really behind what's going on in Scrum. Um, and sometimes it's absolutely explicit as it's in the Pop and Dick. Um, I don't know if that's a valid pronunciation, but as it is in the Pop and Dick books, um, that uh, this idea, these ideas of limiting work in progress, of focusing on flow um, can uh, help with software development just as it does with uh, car manufacture. There's a bit of a problem with this though. Um, which isn't, it's kind of like, it's a sleight of hand with the metaphor. The, th the things that people are talking about when they're talking about lean manufacturing in Japan are established products. They're things that we know as products and we know the value of, like cars, like washing machines is a fantastic book by a guy called Shigeo Shingo called Poker Yoki, which is about how you make 10,000 washing machines without making a mistake. That's great, but you're making an established product. So when Toyota are talking about, um, but when Toyota are making something, they're essentially trying to make something like this, a stream as efficient as possible. What I'm really saying here is when you're starting to do software development on a new project, on a new product, you're not really in the business of value streams. You're in the business of a value swamp. You don't know what all the steps are that need to be put together to generate value. You have to discover those, you have to find out what those are. And then when you find them out, you have to connect them together. So what is a swamp? A swamp is somewhere where we don't know what's in there. We don't know what's in there that's valuable. And even if we do know what's in there that's valuable, we don't necessarily know how to get it out. The other thing that's important to mention is, we don't know who cares about this swamp. There might be people who live in it who don't want it messed with. There might be other people who don't live in it who don't want it messed with, eco-concerned um, people or other kinds of people who want to do something different to this swamp. So there's not a whole load of people around this. Here are the two things that I want to, you to take away that are important about dealing with the swamp. 
The one is that you have to dig your own value streams. Um, you need to kind of do exploration to find out where the value is. What does this actually mean? It means figuring out who the people are who care about that swamp. The people who actually might use things if you could dig something there that'd be valuable. The people outside of it who, who might not use it but still care about it. And also, it means going and exploring with those people to figure out what it is that they really want. Finally, I'm just going to skip over that. What you're looking for is customer pull. You're looking to find something that is valuable that will result in the activity that you're doing in the swamp being sustainable and allowing you to do more activity. And that's five minutes. By the way, that's Venice, which is probably one of the most successful swamps in the entire world. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I enjoyed that. I love the, uh, the swamp analogy um, as well. Does anyone have any, um, any questions at all for Mark on, um, on any of that? Alex, I think you have unmuted this. Two, two observations masquerading as questions. Um, f firstly, thanks very much. Um, I know for a fact that things go wrong, no matter how often you test it uh, beforehand, things do go wrong. So so don't worry about that too much. Um, just just carry on doing all those tests beforehand and, and hopefully it won't happen too often. Um, and uh, the other observation masquerading as a question is that, you know, in the big data world, we, we definitely have very, very similar problems of, of data swamps where people think that they're building value chains through, through data products and they're just kind of throwing stuff into the into the data lake or data swamp, as it were. Um, and uh, this is a very useful analogy. So I'm going to definitely uh, learn more about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Stuff. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I thought that was that was a really really useful analogy, a way to to think about that stuff when when you know you just can't see can't see it. So yeah, thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, if there's no other questions from Mark, then um, I think that that draws to a close of the of the lightning talks. Um, I'm just going to pop a link up there. Um, so that is the place that you can go to sign up to hear about our future um, workshops that we run. We're hoping to get to a point where we run um, two a week at some point. Uh, so how it works, it's, it's a three-step program that would be done through workshops, all completely free. Um, so the first one you sign up to, and there's no preparation at all when you find out what you're going to do and the time. Uh, the last ones that we've done have run for about 45 minutes. Um, and then if you do the, the first workshop, um, then you'll hear a bit more about what to do in the second workshop. And then you pretty much just self-select um, and, and manage your way through the courses. Um, Helen, would you add a thing, anything else to that as somebody that's, that's been on one to explain it anymore? Or is that, uh, does that cover it, do you think? Uh, that covers it. I mean, I think, well, Barry and I have spoken a lot, a lot about this, um, but it's, I'm really hoping that they're going to encourage people who've not yet given a talk to feel a lot more confident and comfortable because it's one thing standing up and giving a talk it's another thing standing up and enjoying giving a talk uh it's another thing i guess having the driver like somebody pushing you and that was very much the case for me i had somebody going helen you're just gonna have to deal with this and get good at it and that's that's the journey that i'm on but that's not the case for everyone and i think um i'm just really hoping that the workshops are you know, do benefit and do help people from, from what I've seen so far, I honestly think they will. And I think that's why, well, I know that's why I wanted to try out one of Barry's uh, frameworks, because the best way to find out if something works is to try it. And I think, I think it worked, right? It so worked. Okay. <laughs> good talk. That, that's, that's pretty good going. And I think so, you know. so as well as practicing, as well as getting used to it, as well as um, learning how to speak to strangers, if you don't do that in your job, and if you haven't had to do that for a while, that's, that will come with this. But there's yep. also going to be some really simple structures for how to select a topic to talk about, um, how to take yeah. that topic and, and put it into um, you know, a five minute talk um, and all those kind of those kind of stabilizers or like uh, training wheels that that will help you at the very beginning. Just get used to the first two, three, four talks. Um, so like I say, the talks today, no, no one needs to go through this. Everyone's speaking. Everyone here is that, that's spoken today um, could be and probably is speaking at conferences. Um, but if anyone else listening would, would fancy giving a go, then, then everyone is welcome. Um, 
So yes, yeah, so you'll feel amazing afterwards. By the way, if you are in that camp, it's just you you do. Come on, everybody who's spoken today, right? You feel good afterwards, right? I'm not lying. See, I'm not lying. So um, you you feel good, and you you will have learned something from the experience as well. So what's not to like? Yeah, hundred percent. I think, I think get, getting into speaking. I, I'll, I'll say one more thing, and then I will. I, I promise I'll go. Um, but, um, <laughs> I, as I say, I've, I've seen so many people start start speaking and change careers. But for me, from a recruitment perspective, it was always like a way to get more job offers, a way to get a higher salary, a way to improve your career, and 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 all those kind of hard reasons to do it. But then I remember speaking to um, oh, I can't remember his surname, um, but Dan and Abe, I think, uh, yeah, at, at uh, conference, LJCM conference. Um, and they gave a talk on why you should get involved in speaking. I remember saying, what was the biggest thing you got out of it? Expecting them to say, yeah, huge salaries and, and that kind of thing. Um, and they, sort of, they both sat back and thought for a while. And they said that the best thing was connections with other people that shared their passions. Um, and how the more you elevate yourself above other people by speaking and, and saying, yeah, this is something I'm, I'm personally interested in. Then other people watching you will gravitate towards you and say, hey, that's pretty cool. So am I. Um, and they just said your life just gets better when you have more and more people that that share your views, share your interests on things. Um, so yeah, so I think speaking has just got so many different benefits. Um, so yeah, as Helen said, it's it's like a drug, isn't it? The adrenaline and stuff that comes afterwards is you can't get away from it. It also means when we do get to go to conferences for real, if you've given a talk, the chances are people come and find you, which is amazing if you're actually quite shy, which I know people won't believe, but I am quite shy. So <laughs> at conferences, I'm like, oh, hide in a corner. Uh, so if I've given a talk, then my hope is that people will come and talk to me rather than me having to go and find people, which is something that I find very difficult. So if we're ever at a conference together, please come find me because I, I will be in a corner somewhere, especially if I've got to give a talk. I'll definitely be in a corner. And you'll be the one with the pink hair. Uh, yeah, potentially the pink might stay. Might The pink might stay. <laughs> Chris, seeing you're just, just joining us, mate, but you're, you're joining just in time for me to say thank you, everyone, for coming. I said it. Oh, no. <laughs> I <missed> it, <laughs> it was amazing. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Oh, jealous. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll uh, we'll see you again next time. Take care. Bye, Mary. Bye.